still do it, to, to, to ask God to help me take my hands off of everything concerning my life so that he could put his hands on everything concerning my life. It's called, it's called surrender. It's what the song was saying. It's nothing I hold on to. I climb this mountain with you, God, with my hands wide open. That means, uh, God, my life, my family, my career, my finances, my health, my relationships, God, I give it all to you this morning, Lord. I give you my past, I give you my present, and I give you my future, Lord. I pray you help me keep my hands off so that you could put your hands on. God, we make room for you today in the house of God. And we say corporately, have it your way. We might have came in, God, with our hands all over everything, trying to control trying to hold on, God, and well-meaning people, God, hold on to things because we don't sometimes know what else to do, but God, in your presence, we can trust you to just let it go, to just let it go to you today, God. We release it all to you, Jesus. Turn our graves into gardens today, God. Take our mess and make it a message today, God. God, many of us came in today, we're free, uh, uh, we're saved, but we're bound hand and foot. We're bound by this or bound by that. I pray, God, before we leave today that every bit of grave clothing would be taken off of us today and we'd walk out of here free in you today, Jesus. Let this be a brand new start of a brand new day, a brand new season for us, God, as a church and as a people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you, Brian and team. We appreciate you. Praise the Lord. The Miss Linda's class is dismissed at this time. The little ones, see you. Have a great time down there. I just want to direct your attention quickly to John chapter 11. If you could just turn me down just a little bit, just because I, I always end up yelling and I don't want to scare everybody. Just turn me down. Oh, yeah, my grandson's sleeping, too. I don't want to wake him up. 
If I wake them up, that means I preached real good today. <laughs> Praise God. It's good to see everybody. I'm grateful uh, to have Mike and Dottie with us today, back for a couple week visit. We're looking forward to Wednesday, the Seder meal, my friend. If, any, if you haven't been there, you try to make it out. It's not too late. We got, we got room for you. We'll make room for you. But Mike and Vicki and the team does such a great job um, really just uh, uncovering who Jesus is in the Old Testament. It's such a beautiful time. It's, it really is an intimate time. So that's at 6 o'clock on uh, this, this Wednesday here in the sanctuary. Uh, chapter 1 of, of uh, um, I mean, verse 1 of chapter 11 um, I'll just read the first six verses, then we'll skip down. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was in Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So she had an intimate relationship with the Lord. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. Notice they didn't say your disciple is sick. They didn't say the one who follows you is sick. It's the one whom you love. It, it, it really uh, points to the fact that Jesus was friends with Lazarus. When he, when, when he heard this, when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now let's just read a few more verses of Scripture, verse 33 on down through 44, and I'll do my best to open this up to you. When Jesus saw her weeping, verse 33, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved, or some translations say he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Uh, where have you laid him? Jesus asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Verse 35, he cried. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? They, 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 they said, look, he's the one that opens blind eyes. He heals leprosy. He causes lame to walk. Uh, Deaf to hear, but this is hopeless. This is way bigger. This is a Lazarus size problem. Anybody ever had a Lazarus size problem? I mean, I've had some Lazarus size problems in my life. Has God ever came through for you in a Lazarus size problem? Let me see your hands. Okay, look around, everyone. Look around. You're not, that's that's awesome. That's your testimony this morning. God has God has been good to you. Verse 38, Jesus, once, once more deeply moved or groaning, came to the tomb, and it was a cave where a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone then Jesus looked up and said, now he begins to pray, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. That's why I had you lift your hands. If God can do it for one, he can do it for all of us. Amen? Amen. When he had said this, verse 43, Jesus called in a loud voice. Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Now, I want to talk to you about the, the promise, the problem, and the provision for the next few weeks. And this one here, we're going to entitle, A Lazarus-Sized Problem Needs a Lazarus-Sized Miracle. Amen? Amen? The book of John is different than the other Gospels where Matthew, Mark, and Luke they're called the synoptic gospel. Sin meaning same, or and optics meaning optics, sin optics, so the same view. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they look at it from the same kind of point of view. John, 
is a little bit different, and it says in the end of John's gospel that he writes his gospel for a specific reason, and the reason is so that we might believe. So when he's talking, uh, the book of John is designed then specifically for those of us, those of you that are at a place where you, you kind of struggle to believe from time to time. And those situations you find yourself in from time to time, maybe today, um, is the book of John is for you. When somebody asks me, where should I start reading the Bible for the very first time, we always tell them, start in the book of John. And the reason is because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are equally as important, but the book of John is going to help you, new believer, to believe. Amen? Amen. So here's the picture. Uh, Jesus was weeping, and Lazarus then would be a picture to you and I of a picture of someone or something that is too far gone. It's a picture, really, of hopelessness. It's a hopeless situation. And Jesus, at this time, is late to the scene. His involvement in the, the whole burial of Lazarus and the sickness of Lazarus, at best, is insufficient. Wouldn't you agree? He, the Bible says, we just read it, that they came to him, they sent messengers to him, and he chose to delay his travel to Bethany, where his friend was, for two days. That means he could have went, but he didn't go. And then he tells us a clue why he didn't go. He says, because he loved him. It doesn't make any sense to you and I. It's like, if you love me, where are you? You know, it's one thing to see death on TV. It's another thing to read about death uh, uh, in social media uh, or to uh, watch it on a, on, a, on a television show. But it's another thing, the Bible talks about this, this death had a stench to it. It was the stench of death. It was the smell of death. It was, it was a finality to it that kind of takes this death to another level. Wouldn't you agree? It's like he's been dead for a minute, for a while. So here's the scene that is set up. Uh, Jesus is walking into this scene where the odds are stacked against him. The statistics are overwhelming and he's facing really what we would call an impossible situation. Wouldn't you agree? Impossible. You know, and maybe you're here today, and you are facing a Lazarus-sized situation. Uh, maybe somebody's listening to us today that's facing a Lazarus-sized problem or a Lazarus-sized uh, uh, season that your family is going through. And, you know, because if I were to ask, and I did already... Uh, it, it, it has, has got, I mean, if I were to ask you if there's anybody here with no problems, <laughs> would, yeah, your hand might go up. There, Alex said he doesn't have any problems. <laughs> Praise the God. Tom, Tom is problem free, but that's a rarity. That's a rarity. Most of us all would agree that we all are kind of going through one problem or another, right? Yeah. Some kind of problem. Some are bigger than others. Um, but in, in other words, when Martha told Jesus at the tomb there that by now, he smells. She was saying, in other words, that it's too little, too late. I'm glad you're here, but where were you two days ago? Where were you three, three days ago? And today, you might be facing a situation that seems too late, that Maybe it's a loved one that's been struggling over and 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 over again, and nothing ever seems to change. Maybe it's a relationship problem. Maybe it's a health issue. You name it. You put your name on it, if that's you. But I kind of, I thought about this, and I don't know if I necessarily heard from the Lord or not, but I'll say that I was led by the Lord to open up this portion of scripture for somebody in here today that's facing this kind of a situation or problem in their life. If there's only one of you, praise God. And I want you, hopefully, to believe before you leave here in a Lazarus-sized miracle for your Lazarus-sized problem. Jesus began to weep, the Bible says. He cried deep groanings. A few other times in Scripture, Jesus wept. We know that he wept over Jerusalem. We know, according 
to the book of Hebrews that he wept in the garden of Gethsemane when he struggled there, not my will, but yours be done, Father. And he's weeping not because he has a generic relationship with Lazarus. He's not weeping because Lazarus was just a common everyday follower of Christ, if there is such a thing. But the Bible refers to Lazarus as Jesus' friend. He was intimately involved in Lazarus' life. They are very, very close. Multiple times the Bible says that Jesus loved Lazarus, the one in whom he loved. So they were very, very close. Uh, that word loved translates into like a deep yearning, deeply yearning, involved with Lazarus. I'm taking a few minutes to kind of paint this picture for you before we really start going, but he starts crying, he's groaning. That word groaning speaks of an intense kind of a inward anger and rage sometimes. It's a deep, hard to describe feeling. That's what Jesus was experiencing. Real grief, in other words. You ever been there? Like real, real grief. A grief that kind of shuts your mouth because you can't even talk. The grief gets that bad sometimes. You don't even know what to say. And if you could say, if it could come out of your mouth, you wouldn't know what, what to articulate. It's that kind of grief. It's crisis kind of grief. It's that kind of grief that Jesus is feeling at this particular time. He's feeling a hopelessness for, for his friend, a devastation for Lazarus, a devastation for Mary and Martha, who also were very close to Jesus. And the Bible is clear that, I mean, kind of let's turn that, let's turn that for a second before we go on. Do you think that Jesus feels that way about Lazarus and doesn't feel that way about you and I? He loves you intimately, wholeheartedly. So much so that he gave himself up. He said, I love you so much, I'm willing to die for you. You and me, not just Lazarus. He's in love with you. He's intimately connected to you. And the, and the Bible actually places you and I in the category of friends with Jesus. Did you know that? We are also his friend. And, you know, some might be shaking their head no in here. Well, not me. That's not me. You don't know me, Pastor. There's better Christians than me. He, he might be friends with brother so-and-so, or, or he might be friends with Tom, but he's not friends with me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know the kind of mistakes I've made. There's no way on this green earth that God would call me his friend, but yet he does. You know, I want you to know this, that, that one of the main reasons why, the, the, why they hated Jesus was because of the friends that he kept. He was a friend with sinners. That puts me in that category. That means he's my friend. And if you're honest, he's your friend too. You might be at enmity with him, but he is not at enmity with you. Amen? He looks at you and says, that person right there is my friend. That person right back there is my friend. That one over there is my friend. Miss, you're my friend. Jesus is speaking to us this morning. He's saying, you are my friends. When you hear that Jesus weeps, it kind of gives you a picture of God's heart for the lazarus size problem. So understand, if he wept over Lazarus and it seemed hopeless to the people that were there, he also is weeping over you. God's heart is personal for people. He becomes heartbroken. He's not detached uh, from your problem. He's not despondent. He's not distant from you. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It's the kind of love that he reaches into the graves of your life and causes not just resurrection miracles to take place, but creative miracles in your life to happen in an instant. That's the God I'm talking about. He's intensely in love. I'll die for you kind of love with you and with me. That's exciting to me. That's the kind of love we're talking about. 
the kind of love that says, I see the situation you're in, but I'm not willing to let you stay that way. I see it seems hopeless to you. I'll give everything that I have for you. I'm not going to leave you in that place of desperation. I'm not going to leave you in that place of crisis. I'm not going to leave you in that place of pain. And Jesus here was questioned by the people. Why? Because he didn't show up for Lazarus. They began to question, and they almost blamed Jesus for Lazarus dying, didn't they? Like, if he was here sooner, this wouldn't have happened. So Jesus was not there to the one who loved Jesus, right? He loved Lazarus, but don't forget, Lazarus also loved him. Lazarus' name means the one who helps, or God's helper. That's what his name literally means. So the one who helped Jesus, Jesus wasn't there for. So the one who loved Jesus, Jesus wasn't, the one who gave everything to Jesus, Jesus wasn't there for. Are you getting the picture? The one who's really kind of given their life for Jesus, Lazarus, is always helping Jesus. Now he needs help from the one that he's always helping, and Jesus is nowhere to be found. So people began to question him. I'm guessing that Lazarus, it's not noted there, but I'm guessing that Lazarus even began to question Jesus while he was getting sicker and sicker. Where are you, Lord? Like John, when he was in prison, John the Baptist, waiting for the Lord to come and set him free. Wait a minute, Jesus opens prison doors and sets the captives free. Now I'm going to be sent to lose my head for the cause of Jesus? Where is he at? Is he really the one, or should I look for another? And that's what happens to us. Well-meaning people who witness this kind of thing happen to others around them even begin to somehow place blame on Jesus for not showing up when it's not Jesus' fault at all because he had something better in store for them. He said, look, if I would have showed up when you wanted me to show up, you wouldn't experience the love that I have for you the way I want you to experience. Amen? Amen. Not just a resurrection. You guys would be happy to know that I'm skipping over a lot of notes. <laughs> I want you to fully understand that this miracle happened. What happened? What the situation was like when Jesus finally showed up? Now, this is according to a man by the name of Tortillion. If you read church history, this man Tertullian, you can read about him. He was a, a great uh, figure in the early church world. He was brilliant, a brilliant preacher, a brilliant thinker. He was an author. He was brilliant uh, to distinguish legal matters. He was also very brilliant when it came to medicine. And this man, Tertullian, wrote a sermon in regards to this situation here with, with Lazarus. Now, don't forget, for 700 years, people would refer to this man, Tertullian, uh, to his sermons, to his thoughts. He would be a primary influence in the life of people like St. Augustine. He wrote what the Catholics refer to as the Apostles' Creed. He was a general when it comes to knowledge about who Jesus was. Very influential as a church leader. And he wrote this sermon, and in this sermon he said several things about Bethany that I want to take a couple minutes to point out to you, and then we're going to pray. I think this will help us know the extent of just how great this miracle was, because nothing, no one, is too far gone for Jesus. Amen? Aren't you glad? I'm a living testimony of that. I mean, I was so low at, at one point in my life, I was looking up at the bottom of the carpet. Ever been there? That's low. And according to Tertullian, Bethany, the area where they were at, would have been populated with people uh, called Elephantine Egyptian Jews. So Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were all Egyptian Jews. And what that means is that they were Egyptian in their cultural practices. But they, they were uh, Orthodox Jew in their religious 
practices. Are you following me? So they would have an Egyptian influence when somebody would pass away. They would bury their dead the way Egyptians would bury their dead. So Lazarus would not have been buried in a traditional Jewish manner, but rather in a Greco-Roman Egyptian manner. So get this. So when he died to prepare his body for burial, they would have drained his entire body of all its fluids. They would have taken out his heart. They would have taken out his brain. They would have taken out his lungs. They would have taken Lazarus's eyes out of his head. They would have taken every vital organ and put them in this honey wine solution in, in, inside of a, a, a pottery jar. Then they would place those pottery jars with the deceased organs in it. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sounding a little graphic here, but I have a point that I want to uh, put across to you. Just how deep this miracle was. It was much more than him standing in front of the tomb, which would have been great anyway, saying, Lazarus, come forth. This man was missing his eyes. He was missing his heart. He was missing his lungs. He was missing all his vital organs. And they put him in this pottery jar filled with this honey olive oil solution with wine, and they would set him in the first chamber where they would bury their dead. It was about a two-by-four section or eight square feet that's where they would lie those pottery jars in there. And then they would have to walk down, some say 40, then what, before they did that, they would sew the body back together. They would put uh, coins over the eyes of the deceased man or woman. And they would sew the body back together and fill the internal of the body with this same similar solution. Then they would take strips of cloth and they would wrap that like two to four inch strips of cloth and wrap him or her like a mummy from foot to head. Then they would take the body down 20 to 40 steps downward into the bottom catacomb where they would place Lazarus' body down inside this, this uh, stone, hewn out stone uh, grave and then they would put a lid on top of that they would back out, and then that bottom area would be covered with another stone lid. So when Jesus finally gets to the area where they're having this memorial service for Lazarus, he doesn't come on day one. He doesn't come on day two. He doesn't come until day four. On day four is when primarily the family members would have their actual public wake or public memorial service. And when he gets there, Martha interrupts him because he says to her, Martha, roll away the stone. And she's like, no, 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 you don't understand, Jesus. I know you open blind eyes. You open up deaf ears. I've, I've seen you do it. I've watched you heal. But it's too late now. By now, he stinketh. By now, the body has been decaying. And you, you, maybe, maybe, Jesus, you don't know that we removed everything from him. He's down in an empty, lonely, dark, cold place, 40 steps downward in a hole. What good is it going to be for me to roll away the door? But Jesus insisted, and they rolled away the tomb door, and Jesus stands at the entrance of that tomb, and he says the famous words, and you've probably all heard them if you've been in church for any time at all. Lazarus, come forth. And if Lazarus was not called by name, some theologians say there was so much power in the things that Jesus said, not one of his words fell to the ground. The Pharisees said, no man speaks like this man, that if he wouldn't have used the name Lazarus and he just stood at that tomb and said, come forth, that all the other graves would have been able, would have been, began to shake and move and they would have came forth as well. That's the power 
in the, in the word of Jesus Christ whom we sang to this morning, who I talk about this morning, the one that we said, God, we take our hands off of our life so God, you, Jesus, can put your hands on everything concerning my life. God, I am, I'm, 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 I'm saved, but I'm still bound by these grave clothes. God, I need you to help me. So Jesus stood at the door and he said, come forth. And they waited. And they waited. And they waited. This didn't happen like that. It couldn't have. He was 40 steps down. He would have had to come up, remove the stone door off the, the, the thing that he was in. He would have had to push past that opening and then bound hand and foot, waddle his way up the staircase to the entrance of the tomb and then finally come out into the daylight and while they were waiting, people got discouraged. Waiting on the miracle. See, I told you it was too late. I told you he came too late. There are some things that Jesus can't do. I told you. Yeah. But not so. And those people missed the miracle. They turned and left. Yeah. Sad, lonely, doubting, yeah. discouraged went home, and they missed the miracle. It's just like the 28-3 to lead that the Falcons had over the Patriots in the Super Bowl. People left. They emptied it out. They're like, it's over. And they missed the most incredible comeback ever in the history of Super Bowls. And think about what happened in the life of Lazarus. It, now, 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 now watch. Jesus, he speaks that powerful word into our life. But then you and I are obligated to do some things. We have to walk our way up those steps. We have to make our way to the freedom that God has in store for us. And when we get to that little two-by-four area right there, right before you get the breakthrough, you got to walk past your old heart. you got to walk past your old vision. you got to walk past the old way you used to think. you got to leave it behind and walk past it out into newness of life. And God gave Lazarus new eyes. He gave him a new heart, which means the ability to see brand new. His heart beat a brand new rhythm. The breath in his lungs was given to him by Jesus Christ himself. The way he thought was different. He had a brand new mind, and God does that every single time we ask him. Do you believe me? He wants to do that every time we meet in this little sanctuary at 786 Washington Street. He wants to give us brand new dreams, brand new hope. He wants to give you purpose in your life where you feel like there's no purpose. God, but you got to walk past some stuff. You got to do your part. And then when you finally get to the, the, the outside of the tomb, this thing is not over. You got to look around to the ones that had their hands up this morning. I hope you got a photographic memory because there was a lot of hands that went up. Maybe I should have you do it again. Who's ever been freed from a Lazarus size problem? Let me see. Look around. Now you guys are obligated to unwrap the grave clothes of those. No, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, you can't have people in here that stink. Why not? Why not? We can't have people that don't look like me. We, don't have, we can't have people that smelleth, <laughs> wrapped in grave clothes, dirty, stinky, gray. We can't have people like that. Yes, we can, and yes, we will. That's who we pray that God sends through these doors to waddle their way up those steps and give their heart to Jesus Christ. And on the way out, they walk past their old life. They walk past their old heart. They got a brand new way to outlook of life. God gives more than just resurrection miracles to his people. He turns graves into gardens. He will give you a brand new outlook on life, brand spanking new dynamic. But it's going to require 
Teamwork. Teamwork. Right? Teamwork. Jesus got to the point where here's, he's face to face with Lazarus and he says, my job is done. He says, you guys unwrap him. You know, you think Jesus could have spoke to the grave clothes? He just gave the guy new eyes. He just gave the guy a new heart. He just gave him a brand new outlook on life. Of course, he could have spoke to those grave clothes and they would have melted off of his body. But he said, now you guys got something to do. And some of those people that were supposed to help left because they were unsure of the real power of Jesus Christ and they left too soon. Don't be those people. Because God has a plan and purpose for your life and my life. All I do is unwrap people's grave clothes. It's not very glamorous. It's the most glamorous thing you could ever do in, the, in, in, in your whole life to help somebody be set free. Because you see, people come to church and we, we get dressed up and we hide behind suits and we hide behind button-up shirts and dresses and all that. And you're bound hand and foot. You still got grave clothes on. We come, we're saved, but, but we still are bound by insecurity. We're saved, but we're bound by fear. We're saved, but we're bound by uncertainty. I can't seem to put my faith into action. I know I'm going to go to heaven. I know that Jesus is who he says he was. I just can't seem to walk it out because you got some grave clothes on. The longer you come, the freer you'll be. Amen. And then one day, hopefully it's today, You'll, you'll walk out of this place or walk out that encounter you had with Jesus and you'll feel different. Yes. The sky will look different. Yes. Everything will change yes. in your life because you finally got unwrapped and walked away from those old things in your life. If any man is in Christ, old things are passed away. All things become new. Amen. Can the team come up? I want you to stand with me this morning. We're going to sing, I just love that song, Grave in the Gardens. We're going to sing our way out of here. You know what's great to praise the Lord? Isn't it great to praise God? It is so great to praise our God. It's so awesome to worship Jesus. He said that when you, when, when you, when you praise me, I step into those praises. So he's here and he's saying, hey, Frank, come forth. He's saying, Dave, come forth. Just put your name there. Many, many years ago, he called me from a grave. It took me some time to make it up those steps, to finally walk past. And then it took a team of people that God assembled around my life to unwrap those grave clothes in my life so I could finally walk this thing out in freedom. Look around to the left and to the right before we sing this song and say, God, help me to be patient with my brother and sister. Help me to be helpful and useful to my brother and sister that, that call this their church home. Help me, God, to be used as an instrument of freedom for your glory. Whether it be big or little, whatever the job is, God, Maybe it's just you want me to weep. Maybe you've called me to intercede and to cry. Maybe you called me to pray. Whatever it is, God, I want that in my life. No more shackles, no more chains, no more grave clothes. We're walking past those old things in our life today, God. By your grace, only through your mercy. Hallelujah. Let's sing. I searched the world but It couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade never enough. And you came along and put me back together. 
Nothing is 